Thank you, Rodney. Um, I um, will be giving the paper, but this um, stems from work um, that I have done collaboratively with Marta. Um, uh, with this paper, I would really like to start um, taking the opportunity to reflect a little bit on the digital heritage uh, research strand, um, on where we've been uh, in the past, where we are now, and where we could fruitfully go uh, moving forward at the time of the uh, data deluge. Now, the field of digital heritage um, has started to emerge more formally in the 1990s. Um, and at that point in time, it was more focused on trying to unpick the impact of digital technologies within and on museum and uh, gallery context. Um, since then, um, the field has um, grown um, substantially, uh, primarily, however, continuing to look at two linked topics. One is the digitization of analog resources and the other is a digital engagement with the past through those resources and other internet enabled uh, objects and spaces. Um, now, um, Literature uh, instead, uh, focusing on digitally born and digitally enabled research, has remained uh, more limited. Um, it is still so today. Um, and those few studies that uh, do exist uh, tend to uh, either look into overarching and theoretically rich uh, problems without, however, um, much uh, empirical grounding <coughs> or uh, they instead focus on uh, developing digital methods and tools uh, and applying them empirically, but without necessarily really engaging um, conceptually fully um, with the problems that um, are, are, are very pressing um, within heritage uh, and heritage research. Now, of course, uh, these two approaches, both of them are uh, entirely um, legitimate and, and uh, they have contributed positively uh, to advance the field. But um, in my view, neither, neither of them um, seems sufficient at this point to explore the complexities uh, of heritage theory and practice uh, in a world of big data. Um, I think we could uh, take a more fruitful uh, approach uh, going forward uh, that tries to really join up um, a rich understanding of heritage theory and practice, which is absolutely paramount uh, to frame uh, meaningful uh, research questions and um, put forward uh, rich interpretations, um, and um, also a direct, uh, so non-fully outsourced, engagement with technicity, um, understood as um, the technology considered in its efficacy and also in its operating functioning. Um, in a word of big data, technicity is at the same time part of both the methodology that we use and the subject we investigate. And it is for this reason that we cannot prescind from a first-hand engagement uh, with it. So on the one end, um, I think there is the need um, to try and overcome the issue of theory being detached from the substance of practice and only existing in its formal essence. On the other hand, um, it is also important to overcome um, what might seem a critical to lifications and research that is devoid of that anthropological, sociological, archaeological and philosophical core that is um, that that is key um, uh, within heritage research and that constitutes the breeding ground of heritage research. So in the next uh, 15 minutes uh, I will try to argue the, this position um, and reflect um, on what it means to navigate big data um, in a hands-on way, developing and adapting research software critically to undertake research in heritage. And I will ask what is the value of big data for heritage research? What are the implications of its use in terms of research design and methodology and also in epistemological terms? 
Um, and I look to address uh, these themes and questions drawing on the digital heritage research done as part um, of ancient identities, um, which, as I mentioned in, in the introduction, um, really aimed at um, exploring the variable ways in which people e interact and value the ancient uh, past um, today in Britain. Now, uh, the digital heritage uh, strand of this project has been structured uh, in two main components. Uh, one component has aimed to capture how activities such as um, heritage site visitation uh, that were explored through offline ethnography by my colleague um, Kate Sharp uh, in Durham may have also unfolded online. Um, so in this case, we try to mirror, if you like, uh, and to some extent follow the um, ethnographic work that was done um, uh, offline. This approach um, is inspired by Christine Hine's work uh, in ethnography um, for the internet, where Hine really underlines the importance of not seeing the digital and the uh, non-digital uh, as two distinct worlds, but keeping in mind that human activities can really cross both online and offline fields, uh, sometimes in fluid ways. The second component of our research instead is digital only, um, and it has aimed to examine political values of the ancient past uh, through the collection of uh, data <coughs> and of social media data in particular. Um, my discussion will focus um, on the second component, um, which studied how objects, places, people and practices from the Iron Age to the early medieval past of Britain and Europe were leveraged to frame, support or oppose, or oppose populist nationalist ideology, uh, ideologies in the context of um, uh, social media activism. Uh, and the stress here was primarily to understand the extent to which certain ideas about the past were used to express political identities and the political futures that people were hoping to see materialized. Um, we wanted to really see how people drew on the past and molded different um, ideas about it into simple myths of origin, resistance and collapse. These were derived as categories from our work. Um, uh, in order to make, to mark divisions between an inside us and an outside them, both uh, vertically, us, the people versus the elite, and, um, and also horizontally, us, people living um, in a certain territory versus foreign others. Um, and big social media data uh, was key to address in this topic for two main reasons that are connected with the twofold nature of social media. The first is um, social media space, um, a space where um, populism and populist nationalism um, uh, and these kinds of sentiments uh, and ideologies are cultivated by certain parties um, uh, and uh, certain party leaders. Um, sorry, the first reason is related to the fact that on these platforms, these kinds of sentiments are cultivated by parties and party leaders and are also um, openly expressed um, by uh, some of those who sympathize with uh, those politicians and parties and uh, with other uh, disgruntled uh, internet users. Uh, Paolo Gerbaudo, who is a sociologist, political sociologist, but also a digital culture expert, has argued that um, in populist movements, social media platforms like Facebook, for example, um, are both the people's voice and the people's rally, uh, because they allow communicating with millions of people, so at scale, in mass, and because being forms of direct communication, um, they uh, can also host um, rebellious narratives. The second reason um, why we found social media data useful um, is that um, uh, this is data and found data. Um, so it is spontaneously offered uh, by people and allows capturing um, and examining um, very rare occurrences that would be quite difficult to examine um, otherwise, um, like 
um, those rare occurrences where people verbalize what is um, an actually really internalized process of drawing on one's experience of the past to um, think about and relate to contemporary social, political, economic issues. Now, of course, to balance out this enthusiasm, um, I'll link back to what Richard was saying um, at the beginning. Uh, being found data means that this data is not raw, it's pre-cooked with business agendas in mind. Um, and uh, this, of course, has a number um, of very complex um, methodological, ethical, uh, technical implications in terms of research design uh, and, and um, implementation. Um, as regards uh, data collection and uh, the ideas and principles that uh, informed it in our case, um, there are quite a few things to say, but here I'll focus on uh, three core aspects. Uh, so the first, um, again, goes back to the idea of publicness and um, what we can consider as a public or a private space. Um, we focused on those spaces, and this is um, a quite uh, common um, position within social media research, uh, where uh, people um, uh, could be, um, uh, could, could reasonably ex expect uh, to be observed by stranger. And by observe, I mean also in automated way, not just uh, qualitatively. So we focused on public Facebook pages, um, where people go and know that they can be read by strangers, and on collections of Twitter, um, of tweets that contain specific hashtag, hashtags of relevance to us. Um, and by including the hashtag, um, you usually want to signal um, uh, that you have the desire to link to a public and wider discussion that is taking place. Now, of course, this also hides the assumption that a, tweet, uh, um, a, a, a Twitter user would know um, this practice and, and implement it. And this is also fair to, to observe. Second point um, that I wanted to um, cover is um, uh, data variety um, and how um, to take this into account uh, in order to ensure comparability uh, between different case studies. Um, in our case, um, we wanted to um, also look at how different myths um, were circulated in relation to political events unfolding in different countries, uh, the UK with Brexit, the US presidential elections, uh, Italy the 2018 uh, general elections. Um, we ensure that uh, we had a um, shared data core um, made up of public Facebook pages of uh, um, key parties and party leaders and collections um, uh, including specific hashtags. But then each case study also had um, uh, additional um, and, and very bespoke data that was correct, characterizing only that case study. For example, um, the, um, the Twitter collections that were already available, like the, the one collected um, um, by Harvard um, and focusing on uh, the 2016 presidential elections, um, or uh, the one that we collected um, and consisting of um, public Facebook pages containing the, key, the, the term Brexit. The other point is um, linked to data variability, um, uh, variety variability and the velocity of change. Um, and how to ensure that we can actually implement a certain design plan over the course of the project. Um, and the only really convincing way of doing this is uh, by ensuring that we are able to respond um, quite quickly to the changes that are implemented by um, social media platforms and external, um, external policy. So we mentioned previously the changes um, uh, with Facebook API, impossibility now without a developer account to extract comments and replies on public Facebook pages. This introduces a change. It means that um, you will have part of the data, um, including posts, comments, and replies, part of the data not including them unless you register the developer account. So all these points, uh, I think, really highlight the need to engage um, with technicity and to um, engage with the technical aspects of the research as well in order to ensure that you have a greater control um, on how you develop it and how you develop your interpretation. Um, 
Now, um, having talked a little bit about the data collection plan, um, how to approach data analysis. Um, and here, our work in, in terms of uh, thinking and reflection was quite influenced by um, the quali quantitative uh, approach that was conceptualized by um, Latour, Jensen and Venturini and published as a paper in, um, in 2012. In this article, the authors argue that digital data sets um, can be navigated without uh, making the distinction between the level of the individual component and that of the aggregated structure. Um, and as also argued, for example, by Blocking Pedersen in another paper in 2014, this is an approach to social research um, that aims to recompose um, the dimensions of the micro and the macro, the whole and its parts, uh, by constantly moving um, between them. It's an approach that is usually visualized um, through network analysis, uh, because that is the most intuitive way of doing so. We tried to develop it from a conceptual point of view a bit more in a different way. Um, so we did not follow individuals uh, through their connections, but rather ideas about the past and how they were used, moving from data intensive to very close up uh, kinds uh, of analysis and back. Um, and for this analysis, we uh, developed routines using primarily uh, R, uh, free, um, an open source software and to a much more limited extent for a paper um, uh, done on drugs with also with Mark Halterwell um, Python. Um, and I'll, I'll quickly exemplify um, how, how we moved between different approaches. Um, and uh, I'll draw on the two subsets of the UK and Italian case study. So for example, um, uh, how we operated on the collection of 1.4 million um, posts, comments and replies extracted from public Facebook pages containing the word um, Brexit. We first um, looked qualitatively through the metadata available at this space um, and how it emerged, uh, the kind of groups that were behind uh, the creation of the pages and were possible uh, through the analysis of URLs. Um, and other information provided in the description, also their relation and link to offline groups. Then we used topic modeling to um, um, tease out um, what um, the, the themes, the topics that were recurring across the corpus and within the subset um, of um, documents that contained uh, mentions of the past, which were located through um, a set of keywords um, that we had compiled through death-based research at the beginning and encompassed um, uh, people and places from uh, the Iron Age Roman early medieval past of Britain, um, but also ways of referring uh, to these periods. Now here, um, we already started to move from big data to small data um, because this subset um, is made of just a few thousands um, of documents. So we progressed with almost semi-quantitative techniques and very simple term frequencies and term associations that allowed us to first understand which kinds of ideas about the past were most recurring and then uh, in, uh, starting to uh, reconstruct um, a very, in a very sketchy way the context of their occurrence. And with um, these techniques we could also um, um, orientate our more qualitative work, making more strategic decisions about what to focus on with the close-up readings. And this was the kind of work that then allowed us to um, understand which specific myths were used and how they were played out by different counts. Um, and um, a, a quick mention of the Italian case study, we um, operated in a similar way here. Um, using topic modeling and also cluster analysis to look at um, the topics um, that were present on um, party and party leaders, uh, Facebook pages, for example, and then um, also on the subsets um, with period specific terms, um, and then uh, using um, simple quantitative techniques to orientate qualitative kinds of analysis, resulting in the um, uh, emergence of uh, uh, sometimes comparable, sometimes not comparable myths um, 
that uh, we could then um, discuss together with the others uh, emerging from the um, UK and from the US uh, case study. Um, now, um, the examples uh, that I've shown um, have been using data uh, intensive methods, uh, particularly, um, well, in a quite iterative way, but certainly more at the beginning um, of the analysis. Um, and they were important, as I said, to orientate also more qualitative kinds of um, in investigations. But the knowledge on the whole that our study produced um, is more similar to the knowledge you produce through ethnographic immersive research. So we exposed a range of uses of the past um, and um, we could discuss um, the kinds of ideas um, about the present that they were linked to um, but we, we did not um, um, talk about population and, and, and sampling and we cannot claim represent representativeness um, in terms of um, um, specific groups um, within society, for example. We can't say that certain ideas were recurring more amongst certain groups than others um, defined um, against social dimensions, for example, because we didn't have uh, that data. And also it's, it's important to remember that this data um, that we've been looking at um, has been changing constantly. There's constant, it, it's, it's, a, it's a moving um, target. Um, so it is um, the, the kind of knowledge that we've produced um, uh, in order to be then tied to specific groups um, within society if we wanted to do that, to do that uh, would need farther um, further analysis and possibly um, also offline um, kinds of analysis. Um, and it is um, for this reason that we've been calling this approach that we've been using as um, uh, data intensive um, ethnography. Because even if there is data intensive techniques, um, they are there technically, but ultimately they expose um, a variety um, of uses that is um, compatible with the results of uh, essentially ethnographic qualitative research. My conclusions um, then would be um, first that I believe that uh, big data is um, of great relevance to digital heritage research, um, even if you just mind the context of one um, Facebook page, because um, it is important to know uh, that the page does not exist in isolation, which we might be tempted to do. Uh, it's connected with others in this complex, huge, multi-level, um, variable, flexible um, deluge of data, but also spaces and um, traces uh, of human activities. Uh, so you cannot fully understand even that list of components without trying to engage conceptually uh, with the idea um, of big data. Second, um, research that uses big data um, to address um, heritage-focused pro problems might be, as in our case, um, mostly ethnographic at its core, even when, as I was saying, it is technically um, data-intensive. Um, this might well, this definitely means that only certain research questions can be approached with this um, in this way. Um, and um, it is important that these questions are really well framed and thought through from a conceptual and theoretical point of view. Thank you. Thank you.